So thank you for joining us this afternoon to the, uh, for the uh, HeadNet track, and we're going to talk about enterprise small cells. I see some familiar fa faces here, especially Andy uh, is back there, who, who can be on our panel here. I don't know why we don't have you on our panel. But we have two distinguished speakers today. One is Art King, who's been chairing this whole track, and he comes from uh, Spider Cloud, who I'm going to leak a rumor for you. Tomorrow they're going to be acquired by Cisco. And if it doesn't happen tomorrow, it'll be next year. If it doesn't happen next year, it'll be in two years. But count my words, they will be acquired by Cisco. Too bad they're not public, right? And then Microsemi will be acquired by Maxim, I think. What do you think, Mike? Yeah? Okay. So, 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 so I make pr uh, predictions like that, and those of you who listen, you know, do pretty well. Right, Andy? Right. Like the Clearwire acquisition by Sprint. Remember that? Okay. So, uh, Art King is from SpiderCloud, and he, uh, I'm sure if you've been here for a few minutes, you know who, who he is. Art has been the mastermind behind what has made small cells an easy to deploy technology. Art and Ronnie, I want to give some credit to Ronnie as well, who's not here. <laughs> These guys have essentially told the industry that, look, if you make small cells as easy to deploy as Wi-Fi access points, then operators will buy it. Don't make it an RF problem. Don't make it a you know, special de de deployment. Make it a, an access point deployment that runs on twisted pair Ethernet cabling using standard POE and standard switches, and these guys did it, and thank you for that contribution to the industry. Our, our engineers did it. Well, <laughs> you told them what to do, right? And then Eric comes from MicroSemi. Eric will talk about the semiconductors that go into some of the small cells. As you build enterprise small cells indoors, uh, we're going to see that, you know, putting 50 little small cells in this building doesn't warrant putting 50 little GPS receivers to do a timing synchronization. They have come up with a way to do this in semiconductor to have one timing distribution that distributes it over the whole building. And we'll dig into that uh, a little bit later. My name is Haig Sarkisian. I'm with Wireless 2020. We're a uh, consultancy uh, based in all over the world. We have 11 different guys in our group in uh, five continents. And we provide advisory services to service providers, and we help them put together business cases. So I'm going to start by figuring out how this is going to work. So Art is going to talk, do a little introduction. I did the introduction for you already. Right. But he's going to tell us a story about how enterprise small cells have been evolving, and a little bit of uh, real life stories about how his company has been uh, contributing to that field. Art? And actually, those were the those were the kind of the, the two graphs that we flipped through. Oh, you don't want to do it anymore. No, no. We're, okay, we're, so we're I'm going to skip to this, and I'm going to skip to this one as well. And in here, he tries to tell Mike back there from Solid that small <laughs> cells work better than DAS, and DAS essentially is too expensive because you need engineers to design it and deploy it, and you're using all kinds of spectrum, you know. So DAS sucks. Small cell, long live small cell. <laughs> but I don't believe it's true because I know better. You know, that really has a role to, uh, to play as well. <laughs> and in here, you want to talk about this or we jump? No. Nope, nope, no, jump. let's continue. <laughs> this, he told you about how bad 3G was and how LTE sort of gave 10x. And where are Eric's? Oh, where are the other slides? Let's go back to see if I have Eric's slides. I swear I put them in there. Oh, hey. they didn't get Can in you there. Show them? All right. So Eric, why don't you take the microphone and talk us about, until he comes out with your slides. Talk us about MicroSemi. Yeah, talk and about MicroSemi, talk about you, and tell us what you do at MicroSemi. Yeah, is the mic on? Can you hear me? Yeah. So for those of you who don't know MicroSemi, uh, MicroSemi is a $1.2 billion company based in California. Uh, is focused on four core segments. Uh, telecom is one of the segments, but also government, defense, and space. So there's a lot of, uh, a lot of uh, technologies that MicroSemi has, including components that you, you mentioned. So uh, system on a chip, FPGAs, RF type of components, 
security related components. I'm actually not about, you know, not part of that side of MicroSemi. I'm part of the side that got acquired about two years ago, which we used to be called Symmetricon, which is part of the timing activity at uh, MicroSemi called the Frequency and Timing Division. So that's what I'm going to focus on today. <laughs> uh, so here, uh, this slide is, I have a couple of slides. Uh, this one is really to introduce the problem being faced to deploy uh, timing and synchronization within a building, an enterprise building. And Art mentioned, you know, that a lot of companies, operators are moving uh, from 3D small cells to LTE small cells. And the LTE uh, environment requires precise timing. Uh, what is precise is 1.5 microseconds. So to be able to uh, coordinate and synchronize the small cells in the building, with that type of precision, usually this uh, diagram depicts what, what the traditional model would be. The traditional model would be to deploy Grandmaster in the server room and to acquire time to put a GPS antenna on the roof. And then you can see with the green uh, cable, you have to cable from the roof to the, master, uh, to the master in the server room go through the floors, get uh, you know, the lease change on the roof to allow for GPS antenna. And these types of expenses, you know, the cost of uh, deployment of these types of uh, environments is very high compared to the small cells, compared to the master device itself. So what we set out to do, actually this type of deployment exists. If you go to the Four Seasons Hotel in San Francisco and you are one of the carrier customer, you will notice that you have good coverage is because there are small cells in the building and we have a master, you know, kind of a 1U device in the server room. But that type of deployment is expensive. So if you move to the next slide, you know, you actually see some pictures, you know, of the GPS antenna that is in that hotel. The type of cabling that you have to, you know, set out, you know, through the building from the roof to the server, to the server room. On the right side, you have the innovation that we brought to the market to solve that problem. The innovation consists of integrating the master, which used to be in the server room, and the GPS antenna, which used to be on the roof, and integrated that into a small device. That so looks so like this, a small the small device, does it have to see the satellites? It's still GPS-based? It, it has a, a GPS receiver. It, it has no? It has. It has one GPS receiver. It has a GPS receiver. Actually, it's a GNSS receiver. So it can receive not only GPS, but GLONASS and others, Beidou. Mm -hmm. And uh, this, you know. Does it have to be outdoor? No, the no. device is indoor. The antenna is outdoor? The antenna is indoor. Everything is indoor in that device. It's actually on the booth. And it solved the problem that I'm describing on the left, which is the traditional model with this innovative so model. So if it's indoor, how does it get the signal from the uh, satellites? So we have special algorithms. There are three capabilities. One is the receiver is very good. You know, technologies has evolved. The receiver is good. We, uh, we use assisted GNSS signals. You know, we, we use ephemeris data that come from the, the network to assess where the satellites are in that particular, particular location to expedite the lock and have a first, you know, first time to first log in, in 15 minutes or so. So that's the second piece, the use of assisted GNSS. So it's a one-time thing. It's a one well, the one-time thing is to have four satellites to give you X, Y, Z, and time. And then after that, you just need one satellite usable uh, in operation. So there's acquisition and then operation. And then the so you need to buy a satellite with it. No, the. <laughs> no. You said you need one satellite. You need one satellite <laughs> signal, you mean? Visibility, yeah. So, so you still need to go outside. If you're going to go outside, what does it matter whether you look at one satellite or three satellites? No, you don't go outside. The, the, the device. Yeah. Didn't he just tell us he needs one satellite? <laughs> when I sold him a satellite, he didn't want to buy it. When I put the antenna outside, you said it's inside. I'm very Actually, confused. Microsemi has a lot of components in satellites. So you, we sell, there you go. We sell uh, components in the satellite industry. But uh, the, the third aspect of it is really algorithms. So, so you still did not answer me. How do you get the signal from the satellite if you don't put an antenna outside? The right? antenna, no, the antenna is indoor, but the, the it's algorithm... It's sensitive enough to get the signal from the satellite. Yes, it uses, my, my, my last point is really what answers your question. 
So we have a patented algorithm that we use in all the timing uh, devices that we have. And the basis of it is to take several types of inputs, you know, in the traditional timing uh, environment, E1, T1, SYNCHE, PTP, GPS, etc. And from that multitude of inputs, we derive precise timing and sync. That's what we have as a patented algorithm. In this particular case, we use this algorithm not to derive multiple types of syncs, but to take m a multitude of GPS signals that are very weak and make sense out of, that sig of those signals and derive precise time out of that. So that particular algorithm is what I would call the secret sauce. And of, once of you get product. it, you share it with the rest of the network through the wiring infrastructure? So yes, yeah, so like Amit said this morning, you know, it's uh, the Ethernet you know, network that is present in the enterprise is really the neutral host infrastructure for us. So we connect this device through an RJ45 to the rest of the in, uh, infrastructure network. So this is kind of the alternative to the first picture I showed. So you don't have the, the use of the GPS antenna on the roof anymore. The small cells are where they need to be. So you know, depending on the site survey of the small cells, the small cells are deployed in the building where they need to be. And the timing product is deployed where it needs to be in terms of GPS acquisition of signals. So you know, ideally not too far from a window, in a higher floor if possible. So there's a lot of flexibility, uh, but it doesn't need to be on the same floor as the small cells. It needs to be in a location that makes sense for itself. So it's kind of uh, dissociated from it, and it's connected to the small cells because the small cells are the client, and this device is the server, the master in, in the 1588 parlance. So they are connected to each other via Ethernet. Excellent. Thank you, Eric. We're going to switch to the other presentation that has the questions. And I'm going to ask a few questions and then open the floor for you guys to ask questions of our panelists. So uh, Art, let me start with you. Why are enterprise small cells important? What problems do they solve? And do they solve it for one operator at a time? Or is there a small cell solution that you can come to a building like this one and you can install a small cell that works on the AT&T network and the Verizon and the Sprint and the T-Mobile? It's real simple. Enterprises are wanting small cells to make their mobile devices work right and to make the employees and, and the tenants in the building stop complaining that their phones don't work. I mean, netting it out, it's just that simple that they want service. And you know, enterprise is an interesting market because you have IT buyers that are a decision maker for maybe thousands of people. So you have one person to talk to that influences you know, the, the satisfaction of a lot of downstream, downstream employees. All right. So we're back to our, so we were all here all along. I don't know why they didn't come up earlier. <laughs> oh, they went in the wrong order, that's why, okay. So we're down to this one is here. So what should we expect in terms of user experience when we pay thousands of dollars and upgrade this building or an enterprise building and put small cells in it? Should we expect better signal than we get because it's from the indoor? Should we expect higher speeds? Give us some examples of, you spoke about in Europe, that testing you showed. Give me some numbers as to how, when it's good, what should I expect good to be? It, it's, it's more coverage and capacity and KPIs are met everywhere in the network. Not Average sure. capacity APIs, KPIs? Well, the small cells are interesting because the, the coverage area is so small that when you go to wire on a gig ethernet. Can um, you hear him back there? Yeah. Okay. When you go to wire on a gig Ethernet with, with maybe 30, 40 people connected, you get an extremely high performance experience. It, you know, the, when I look at small cells, it's, it's the equivalent of breaking up a shared, a shared space similar to how Ethernet switches made Ethernet successful back in the 90s by breaking up a giant collision domain into little tiny domains with just one host. So, you know, small, cell, small cells have the ability to get you to wire and out of the RF real quick. Okay, so essentially you're saying you divide each section of a building into smaller areas and put a small cell in them. Right. And you put many small cells in the building to provide good coverage, but each small cell has the full capacity of the spectrum that it covers, right? right? Tell me how do you, like, should I expect to see multiple different frequencies of AT&T or Verizon, whoever small cell I deployed? 
Should I expect to see a 3G integrated with 700 megahertz together with AWS? Or how many radios and frequencies do you cover in one box? So we, we build a dual carrier radio, and most of them are you know, per operator. So It's like, per operator. It's not a neutral host solution. Right. Okay. Right. And, you know, we're, we're working on that, as is the industry, you know, because it's, uh, it's, it's, it's demand that's made by third parties and building owners, not so much the operator community because the operator community wants to light their own spectrum at, you know, because it's their subscribers. And at 100% market penetration, the way you grow market share is by taking subscribers from other operators. So there's a certain motivation to not light other people. OK. Any questions from the audience, too? Yeah, go ahead. So what are the, what are the uh, pros and cons versus uh, a Wi-Fi, right? So if I'm an enterprise or or middle prize, and I um, put in a, a strong Wi-Fi network. I mean, essentially, that's carrier neutral, right? And and I support that. So, you know, what would be the uh, advantage? And not not trying to jab you. I'm just. I think it's a good question. That no, no, it's, it's 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 a good question. I mean, uh, a 360 degree support of all the all the functions on the device without any intervention. And one one of the things. So so before Spider Cloud, I came from a global enterprise, and. I talked to my CIO out of a number of these things because I looked at him and said, dude, you want me to, you want this campus to know all 12,000 people know that there's someone to, that will deal with drop calls that can pick up the phone and force, so, but, force but, things to be done? But that's a voice issue, right? Right. That's a voice issue. For data, he's but, talking about Wi-Fi. For data, why not just do a good Wi-Fi network instead of small cell? That's the question. Right. Let's stick to the question. It, if it's if it's an open network, you know the big thing. In the is enterprise, you can make it open. You can control who you give it to, right? And, and yeah. you can you can um, VLAN it so. And you could VLAN it so that way uh, you don't it's have secure. to you don't have to uh, um, worry about uh, uh, I guess uh, opening holes in your network, right? So you could VLAN it back out in internet an internet connection. Right, and that's that's rarely done. When you look at a lot of enterprises, that's not a common practice. They, they, don't, they don't build a network for somebody else. They build it for themselves, generally. So well, let I mean, me ask Eric. building it for the employees, though. Right, but there's guests, and there's, there's contractors, a lot of people that flow through. There's some enterprises where the Wi-Fi is so overburdened that they can't put additional devices on it. And we've, we've, we've dealt with some hospitals that are looking at this as a solution to unload their Wi-Fi, because they don't want to unload more and more traffic onto Wi-Fi because of clinical devices and other things that are all kind of fighting for the same spectrum. Let me ask Eric, if in an enterprise business I have Wi-Fi and I go there and download my four gigabyte HD movie, who do I pay to do that? But first of all, you're not supposed to download movies at work. No, but <laughs> I mean, go with me for a moment. <laughs> I didn't say it was X-rated or anything. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, but, but if, I, if I download it on the Spider Cloud Verizon small cell, guess what? The four gigabytes came out of my plan, right? So the answer to your question is, if we do a good Wi-Fi network, unless we figure out how to monetize it, we're not going to make money on it. We, the service providers, are not going to make money on it. That's probably one of the reasons why you see enterprises aggressively trying to deploy indoor networks so that they can capture the gigabytes. Right? The MNOs. Is there a better reason than that? Money is the main reason why you want to run the network on your own spectrum if you're an operator. The amount of users that would be using that network, uh, uh, the RI may not be good enough to put in your own dads, right? To spend that kind of money. I mean, you could easily spend north of a, of a macro site, you know, with the DAS or with small cells or and whatnot. So, um, yeah. The R may not be there for, for uh, a handful of employees to, to, to use more of their um, uh, um, you know, uh, rate plan, especially if they're on the computer doing work anyway, right? Yeah. I mean, the main reason is if you go to an en enterprise business, there is a Wi-Fi there put by the enterprise IT division. Right. I think the capacity is, is good enough. They're not worried about offloading from the Wi-Fi to the, to the uh, LT. You know, it's because... When people come in and they want to use their cell phones and they want to do voice, they want good voice network that Wi-Fi is not mature yet in the voice over Wi-Fi space to really do that. In a couple of years, that's going to change. 
right? And the other reason is, look, they can monetize the gigabytes. You make the investment to make money on it. Right? Any other questions? Okay. Did he say five minutes left? No, we're good. Okay. I think he said five. All right. Any other questions? Uh, why don't we continue? Uh, you told us some of uh, the success stories you're having in the enterprise building. Are there any other examples you want to give us, uh, Art? Well, within, within LTE, you know, the, the, we, we can see macro offload, which is an excellent effect to prevent you know, the, the need to upgrade the macro network. So in some of our early installations with band class 4, band class 13 uh, dual radios, you can see how the band class 4 attached uh, UEs just dramatically declines because they're getting signal inside the building instead of, you know, picking it up from the macro network. So, so are you worried about interference between the small cells you deploy and the outside macro? Because why? Your signal is too weak inside because the glass doesn't allow the macro Be to come in? Between the glass and then the, and then the engineering process to make sure that, you know, you, I mean, you're dealing with only 24 dBm radios. It's, it's not... 24 it's not dBm for your information is less than 100. No, it's 200 milliwatt. 250. 250 milliwatt. So, a little bit more than Wi-Fi. Wi-Fi is 26 dBm, right? Mm -hmm. So Wi-Fi like uh, power. And do you provide power to these, or do you provide power over Ethernet? No, the power comes from Ethernet switches. So there's no kind of installation of okay. electrical circuits or anything. And Art, do you want to share with the audience about how to deploy small cell networks without even doing wiring? Um, yeah, that's a collaboration that we're doing with Cisco to create, uh, we created a module that plugs onto the back of the Cisco 30 